Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Sustainable Business Development panel. We're the three Bs. I'm Kelsey Logan, and my project's about microbreweries. I'm Kimberly Barton, and my project is about bourbon and soil health. And I'm Ben Lucky, and my project is a sustainable business model for Gunnison County. So why did we all band together to become a panel? We all identify different need gaps in our very unique communities. A lot of these focused on two main things, supply chain management and intervention, as well as economic growth through innovative partnerships. So we all came together and decided that all of our product projects really focus on creative uh, sustainability industry growth. And Kelsey is going to be our first presenter. All right, good afternoon everybody. Thank you guys so much for being here and thank all of you for watching at a distance as well. We really appreciate it. Um, so like I said, I'm Kelsey Logan. My project is Creating Circularity in the Craft Beer Industry, a case study of Guild Goat Brewing Company. And I really wanted to work with microbreweries and do this type of talk project for a few reasons, um, but I will talk more about that here in a second. So, Craft breweries. What is a craft brewery? Um, the Brewers Association defines this as a brewery that is small, independent, and traditional. And small in this sense actually isn't as small as you would think. It's more relative compared to some of the Goliaths we know in the larger beer industry like AB InBev or Miller Coors. So small in this sense is under 6 million barrels a year. Still a lot. If you think of Sam Adams Brewing Company, they're the largest microbrewery across the US. So that's the scale there. Uh, and within the craft beer industry, it's taking off like no other. So on this graph here on the right, you can see it's just going straight up. From 2014 to 2018 alone, in four years, the number of breweries across the US, craft breweries, um, nearly doubled. So they went from 3,814 to 7,346. It's a lot of breweries. And the majority of this growth has been the microbrewery sector, which now takes up 61% of the entire market. And I also, so going back to why I really wanted to work with microbreweries. To me, it's a, it's a really unique industry, the craft beer industry as itself. Uh, they really focus on a few things and really are passionate, caring, and don't think of their product at the end of the line as production and a dollar sign. It's, it's the ingredients, it's the community, it's the people who made it. And, you know, it's, it's these three values. Sorry, my font got a little wonky here, guys. <laughs> um, but community, collaboration, and being local. These are three pretty consistent themes within craft beer and microbreweries in particular. And the Gilded Goat Brewing Company, which is the brewery I got to work on directly for the past year and a half, um, really focuses on these and has since they started just over two years ago. Uh, we work with local companies like Harbinger Coffee that are added into our beers, but we also work with local malting companies, local hop growers, and really consider the community aspects and collaboration, not just within the community and within our sector, but on a national scale. And, you know, these values make it such an interesting dynamic because most industries don't have collaboration. It's, it's more competitive. It is that dollar sign at the end of the <laughs> line. And in this sense, it's more about building the knowledge and understanding of what goes into beer instead of, you know, what you're drinking at the end of the line. Or, sorry. So when I first started my project, I really dove into the various steps of the brewing process. And most people think of water and grain when they think of beer. So these top pictures here in the mash tun. But a lot of people don't necessarily think about all the technical sides of the brewing process and how much more goes into it than just hops, water, yeast, and grain, typically barley. But you water the beer, you pump it into this kettle where it boils, and you're transferring that again to these fermenters and then transferring to package. And in here you have different heating and cooling systems within. So you're using 
more energy at each step. You're using more water at each step to rinse. And then after it's all produced, you still have to go back and sanitize. So it's an entire extra process, essentially, on top of this that, you know, creates a more resource intensive industry than most people think. And on these microbrewery scales, it can be really hard to make efficient steps and processes because it's easier to do that on a larger scale when you have not only the more money and more time, but you have more opportunity and scalability. So you can use the same amount of water and make a lot more beer. It's just how it works. <laughs> and so these microbreweries don't have necessarily the tools or resources provided to them as the sector is growing at such a rate um, to do this. So I learned a lot about the brewing process um, directly with Charlie Hawksmeyer, my uh, community sponsor. And I came up with a few key points to tackle with my project. I wanted to send out a survey and try and really understand what other microbreweries or breweries in general across you know, our region we're doing, and then I wanted to collect and analyze and benchmark all of the Gilded Goat Brewing Company's data. Uh, and then we went back and kind of monitored some of the small impl implementations we were able to do, uh, and then looked at, you know, from what we knew at that point, what, what options or opportunities or low-hanging fruit was still available that we could attack. And so from all of this, we came up, I came up with a set of recommendations and a final report for the Gilded Goat Brewing Company. It could not only hopefully help them um, find more sustainability options um, over you know a short period of time to a long period of time, but it could be scaled out to other microbreweries across the nation. And so initially I started with the survey and <clears throat> partnered with the Colorado Brewers Guild to have them sent out. Um, we sent it out, I think there were about 300 breweries across Colorado at this time involved with the Brewers Guild. And we had an 11% um, response rate. So not great, but still enough. And it provided us quite a, bit, quite a bit of good information. So we learned that basically a third of the breweries we talked to or that responded had been using the Brewers Association tools, but a third of them hadn't. And then another third didn't even know what they were. So that was really interesting when we also realized that almost two thirds of them already had sustainability measures in place. So they cared about this without even necessarily tracking it through a benchmarking tool. And so with this two thirds that was already implementing sustainability measures, we found that 99% were already working directly with farmers to collect their spent grain, essentially eliminating an entire waste stream from their brewing process. Unfortunately, though, there were some, uh, some responses that provided opportunities for us, or for my project. So just under 30% were neutralizing their sanitation water, um, which is not necessarily regulated, but is important. And same goes for the side streaming your solid waste. Um, this is important as you get larger in breweries because it does become regulated. But just under half were doing this at this in Colorado, essentially. So whether that be regulation based or not, it likely will be at some time with the growth that's happening everywhere. Um, so we noticed that those were probably good points to remember and keep in mind throughout the project because they're great opportunities and will be, you know, important in the future for beating policy. So once we had a better idea of what the overall state wanted and what they thought their needs were, I set off to work with the Brewers Association and benchmark all the Gilded Goat Brewing Company's data. Um, these are actually the graphs. These are graphs from their new benchmarking tools that I'm helping establish, um, hopefully by the end of the summer. And then in here, you can kind of see that, well, so our electricity is about 220 kilowatt hours per barrel. So that's how it's measured across the board um, for comparison. And it's just above the median average for our production size. So under a thousand barrels a year. And our purchase CO2, so this is an updated graph. So we are just at the average here, but I'll explain how we got there in a little bit because we weren't there when I did these graphs initially. And so, 
just to give you a better idea of um, what the Bruce Association benchmarking tools kind of provide for you, it, they outline, you know, they give you this sheet of like, this is your production size, this is the different um, classes within that and tiers and where you fit within. This really helped me identify next goals for the brewery. So if we're at 220 kilowatt hours per barrel in electricity, the median is 182. That's a great next goal for us. Um, another thing that the Brewery Association tools did that I really liked and, and just a marketing standpoint, um, they showed not just the cost benefits of all these reductions and what these goals would reduce, they also showed the environmental benefits of reaching these goals, um, outlining it in vehicles removed from the road. So while we are at three, if we can reach all of our 2021 goals, it's still a pretty big deal for a brewery producing about 400 barrels of beer a year. So once, once we could benchmark and set our goals, I went back and monitored some of the different stages of the process. Um, we really focused on some equipment that we were able to trial. And we also really looked at different waste streams from ingredients and other utilities. So I'm just going to talk about a couple of these. But this is a seed box. So it's Anton Parr is the company. They created this little device. Basically, you can hook it up at different stages in the brewing process, and it tells you how much carbon dioxide you're pushing into a tank and how much dissolved oxygen is still in that tank. And when you put beer into a tank, you want all of that dissolved oxygen gone. Otherwise, your beer is going to taste like cardboard. And so that was, that was a really innovative tool that we were able to test run for a couple weeks um, and let us basically reduce our purchase CO2 by 50% because we were able to actually see how much we needed to use versus just using it until basically you smelled it and you felt like you might pass out because that's the historic way of measuring that. <laughs> <laughs> so finding kind of creative and innovative ways to conquer some of these problems. Uh, another one we were looking at ingredients was we had a, I mean, so, you know, most breweries remove their spent grain. They have partnerships with farmers. But farmers don't want your spent hops. And as many of you may know, hops are dangerous for a lot of animals. And a lot of animals just don't want to eat them because they're bitter and not necessarily tasty. So when you have that spent yeast, that spent hops at the end of brewing, it's this common struggle of not knowing what to do with it. And so kind of like stepping back and being like, all right, maybe I can't conquer this within this time frame. We started looking at some of the other waste streams within ingredients. So the packaging. The packaging was by far the next biggest one. We get a giant pallet of grains once a week. Grain bags are, you know, probably up to here on me, this big. And you just have to throw them away because our single stream recycling doesn't necessarily account for it. And while I may want to take them to the recycling center, can't say that everyone who I work with does. <laughs> So trying to find other solutions. Um, so our next step was we thought about using them as potters for hops in the front of the brewery to almost start a conversation then with customers and you know be able to talk to them about, oh yeah, these were our spent green bags and we're, we're trying to recycle and reuse them. So this is what we come, came up with. And then maybe that's starting a way of others finding more opportunity and more reuse for them before you have to recycle. And then leading to more of my engagement and education. So I've talked a lot about all the ingredients and some of the utilities um, that we focused on in my project. But what a lot of the recommendations ended up being were more about engaging with the customers, with the employees, and educating them on you know, sustainability, sustainability efforts in a brewery, what that necessarily means, and just <clears throat> trying to create a, a change of culture in the brewery of wanting to recycle more, knowing if it's recycled. Um, a big piece of this that we're working on, or I'm hopefully gonna work on this summer some more is with events. So we're, we have a box downstairs and an upstairs, and we rent out the top floor for events at the brewery. And one thing I learned from another local brewery in Fort Collins 
horse and dragon. Um, they <coughs> require or they require their guests to bring their own plates and silverware or reusable ones. They'll wash them for them if they want, but require them to bring this. Or if they don't want to, they can take out all of their waste with them at the end of their party. It's a really good way to show people the amount of waste they're using or to help them see how much waste that creates for us and changes then our environmental impact as well. So just trying to create a conversation and engage as many people, not just within the brewery, but within the community to ultimately create a new culture and norm within microbreweries as they just grow and grow and grow. So I just want to send out a huge thank you to Charlie and everyone at the Gilded Goat watching right now. Um, as well as Abel, thank you so much for everything you've done for me over the past few years. Uh, the Brewers Association, the Colorado's Brewers Guild, and all my family and friends who are watching and are here. And you guys. <laughs> There are 24 people online, so I'll remind you if they have questions, just type them into the chat box. Sorry, I hated that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you're talking about um, sort of the byproducts of some of this meant green and how there's no good solution for it. Is that like true across the board or is that just true at the microbrewery level or sort of in your particular situation because of the bigger thing to tackle? So the, the grains, we actually, like almost every brewery has a solution for that um, because you can just give them to farmers as feed. Um, and it basically can be a substitute for about 30% of the feed for um, cattle, at least, because that's who we send ours to. Um, but for the, the yeast and the hops, and this has been like the biggest research time consuming part of this project, I think. But um, so yeast is really nitrogen rich. So it'd be really great for composting. But in Fort Collins, I can't find anyone who will just like accept it like a little garden or anything. And CSU, who I tried to reach out and work with on it, have really stringent acceptance rules for theirs. Like it can only be from the school. Um, so I've been working more and I actually, like the day before I left, saw this like composting car driving by and they like collect, come drive around and like collect compost. And as soon as I, I was like, wow, I hadn't like thought about anything like that because I hadn't seen anything like that in Port Collins. So that is the next step. But yeah, across the board, most breweries just have to separate it and then dispose of it. There's, use it for energy, I guess, maybe, no, I don't know. Eventually in the future, maybe. Um, you highlighted some of the environmental benefits, but did you also look at some of the financial benefits of some of the solutions you recommended? Yeah, so in those tools, they have like a whole page basically of, you know, if your usage is at this at, with your baseline and then your cost is at this and you can change the cost for like your goal setting and stuff, um, you, it basically equates it for you and lets you know, this is how much your reduction would be. Um, and basically how much like you would save from that reduction then too. So yeah, they did. They do provide a lot of, and they're actually gonna be doing more of that with the new tools. It's just way better set up so you can input if you're, you know, if you have solar panels and if those are producing energy and how much that would offset your other electricity and if you would gain or lose, I don't know, all of those things. And it's gotten really complicated, but it's really awesome because it's needed with, such an intricate industry at this point. And an online one? I got a comment and one question. One is to try Happy Heart Farm from Genevieve. She suggests trying that for the Okay, cool. And then um, why do you think you had such a low response rate with your survey if microbreweries tend towards a deeper environmental ethic compared to other industries? Do you think the survey responses were more likely to come from more sustainability-minded facilities? So, well, one of the issues we realized with the survey is that we sent it out at like the time of the year where all of the big conventions and conferences and all these things are going on. And so that was, you know, a little bit of a struggle. Um, I also think that breweries get blown up with so many emails, like the brewers themselves and have such little staff on hand for that. 
that they're the only ones responding to those, so can't always necessarily reply to every survey. I think we, we send it out and then send it out like a couple days later as a reminder almost. Yeah, um, but that is exactly the case for the Brewers Association and their benchmarking tools. Like they have such a low response rate, and that's why we're totally revamping them and using Excel and not some fancy program because we think it'll be the easiest way to get more people on board with using a system they already know. There is another one. <laughs> In your experience, what's the lowest cost, highest impact intervention that a small brewery could implement? Hmm. So I would say it's definitely um, location focused and also, I mean, it depends on, so in Fort Collins, our electricity is a lot cheaper than say natural gas. Um, we thought water would be our biggest <coughs> concern because of our location, but because of our equipment and mm -hmm. other steps and processes within that Charlie knows because he's great at what he does. Um, we were able to reduce a lot in that, but I'd say the biggest low cost, high impact one would be probably the carbon dioxide. Because it, it didn't take a lot to get those findings and we immediately, you know, had a reduction by 50%. So that was huge on what I got to do at least. But I'm out of time. Thank you guys so much. on soil health and bourbon, building sustainable agriculture in Kentucky. Before I get started, I do want to say thank you to my dad, stepmom, and my fiance for being here today, as well as my coworkers watching from a distance. I also wanted to say thank you to my advisor, Suzanne Yui, for all your guidance and, frankly, patience over the last two years. And, of course, I wouldn't be here today without the support of the Kentucky Nature Conservancy, without the collaboration and teamwork uh, and guidance from them, we wouldn't have this project today. So when I first started in January or February of 2018, we really had this question of how do we work to create environmental sustainability while maintaining or possibly even increasing financial stability for producers. So we worked with our North American agriculture team, which is part of the Nature Conservancy worldwide, uh, to kind of narrow down some strategies that were really going to work in Kentucky with the culture and environment that we have there. So we narrowed it down to soil health research, supply chain management, and education. And of course, all three of these really feed back into each other and focus a lot on collaboration. None of our work that we've been able to complete over the last year and a half would have been able to be completed without the wonderful partnerships that we've been able to build. For today's purposes, though, I am going to focus on supply, supply chain management, which is our bourbon project. In January of 2018, my chapter, the Kentucky chapter, and the Tennessee chapter partnered together to com commission a supply chain study. We started out looking at three different agricultural products, which were cattle, soybean, and corn. Uh, Kentucky is actually the largest cattle producer that side of the Mississippi. Uh, in 2018, we actually ended up adding poultry on as an addendum because we did realize that both Kentucky and Tennessee contribute pretty heavily to the poultry supply chain in the United States. Kentucky is the seventh largest producer for poultry uh, in the U.S. So we partnered with the University of Kentucky to complete this study. What they did was they analyzed everything for each one of these agricultural products from start to finish. So they looked at all of the inputs from equipment, feed, seed, fertilizer, all the way to the end consumer product. And they also focused on who was purchasing agricultural products in region and who was how much of it was being exported out of state. So the final results for that project were shared in September of 2018, and they looked a little bit like this. So this is the corn supply chain for the state of Kentucky. Uh, the University of Kentucky actually broke each of these sections down into industry first, and then into the highest purchasing company within those industries. So as you can see, pretty early on, we identified that distillers are pretty big purchasers 
of in-region corn sales. So we identified really early on that we wanted to work with the distillery industry on a supply chain project that could potentially implement sustainability metrics for grown corn. But before I go a little bit more into that, I have a question for all of you. What makes bourbon bourbon? Does anybody know? It actually does not have to be made in Kentucky, although 90% of the world's bourbon is produced in Kentucky. It has to be made from corn? It does have to be made from corn. So that is the biggest part of this. 51% uh, of bourbon has to be made from corn. Uh, it also can't have any other additives, which is why you don't see like cherry vanilla bourbon and things like that. Oh. <laughs> That's what your mixers are for. So, <laughs> bourbon and ag. So because 51% of the bourbon mash has to be made from corn, over 50% of the corn used in Kentucky distillers products comes from Kentucky. So they're already heavily supporting the agricultural industry in our state. This amounts to about 90,000 acres of corn. Uh, we do actually have the ability to scale that up and increase it to 100, 100%. So there is a lot of scalability within the bourbon industry. When we first started looking at this project, we really realized that we really needed to identify key partners to work with in the distilling and what that could lead to. So our goals were working with distilling industry to create soil health metrics for grain used in distilling. So soil health metrics would look like anything from implementing a nutrient management plan to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus that goes into the water, or cover crops, which is a crop that is planted after cash crops, so after your corn is harvested, to protect the soil. It also has a bunch of other benefits. Uh, incentives for producers participating in a sustainability program. This could be anything from a cost share method to help producers implement these sustainability metrics to uh, increasing the price per bushel. So 25, a 25 cent per bushel increase uh, on their purchased grain, which doesn't seem like a lot, but in unstable agricultural times, it really makes a difference to the producer. Marketing claims, I'm gonna get a little bit more into this on the next slide. This is an incentive for both the producer and the company. So a marketing claim is just something the company or producer can say, I'm participating in this program to increase my environmental sustainability. This is why you should purchase my product. And then of course, reduce environmental impacts. Any sort of sustainable soil health metric that a company ends up implementing with a producer will lead to these reduced environmental impacts that they can measure and again, use in marketing claims. So the company's why. Why would a company want to implement a voluntary program for sustainable agricultural products. There's currently no regulation out there that really encourages companies to do so. So there's really two reasons, for the good of the environment and for the good of the company. And those two reasons really end up being the same reason because they really feed into each other. So for the good of the environment, if they're implementing these sustainable agricultural practices, they're having measurable impact reduction. They're also building a new and more resilient future for that farm producer. So if they're implementing a soil health strategy that's going to reduce nutrient runoff, that means that those nutrients are staying in the soil, which could increase the crop production on that farm. It also decreases environmental impact and can protect both the producer and the company from negative uh, regulation, like violating EPA rules. And for the good of the company, this goes back to that marketing claim. Companies can use these sustainable impacts to make marketing claims. For example, if they're doing cover crops or planting pollinator habitats, they can promote that on their website to meet, reach these new marketing segments. It increases their or competitiveness. They can diversify their products. Uh, a lot of you may have seen a few years ago, Cheerios did the wildflower project where they did a Save the Bees push and they actually gave out over, over a billion seeds to people to plant wildflower habitats. Now there were some issues with that campaign, but <laughs> General Mills overall partnership with the Xerxes Society that helped them come up with that campaign has been highly successful. By 2021, they're hoping to actually plant over 100,000 acres of pollinator habitat because they recognize the need for this. But again, it's also a really positive marketing thing for them because they can say, look how we're helping the environment that support the products that we need. Uh, and beat regulation. So right now in the current political environment, I'm sure most of you are aware, there's not a lot of environmental regulations that are being passed. There are more so at the state level, depending on the state you live in. But 
when regulation like the Clean Water Act or adaptations of the Clean Water Act start to come down the pipeline, companies can be early adopters to kind of avoid this regulation. So where are we now? Uh, Kentucky TNC began meeting with a major distiller in early spring of 2019. Our role has really been uh, to serve kind of in that consultation role early on. We wanted to meet with a distiller to work together to create some sort of sustainability metric goal. We didn't want to come to them with like an extremely laid out plan because we wanted to have that collaborativeness to work together. Our goal, again, was to define these sustainability metri metrics for grown grain, focusing on corn. There are other agricultural products that go into bourbon, like barley, wheat, and rye. Uh, some of those are grown in Kentucky, uh, but on a much smaller scale. Uh, determine the system to utilize. So if we are going to engage in these sustainability metrics, is TNC going to serve as the main project manager? Are we going to build, bring in a third party verification system? Uh, are we maybe going to work with one of the universities in our state to complete some of this work? Excuse me. Will we identify producers to partner with? Do they have contract growers that are supporting their corn already? Or do they just get their products from grain elevators? And if they do get their products from grain elevators, how do these sustainability metrics end up working? And then, of course, developing a project timeline. Is this something that we're going to be able to implement in the next year? Or is it going to take 10, 15 years to get off the ground? So we are actually still engaging with that same distiller. Uh, we've already identified some next steps. The company that we are working with has identified that they do want to implement some scientific measures. They are focused on implementing cover crops uh, as a sustainability metric for their grown grain, starting with a pilot farm uh, with one producer. So because they have identified that they want to do some scientific metrics, we have uh, recognize the need to bring in some additional partners, maybe the University of Kentucky, who is our land grant university that has the extension office, to come in and do things like soil tests. We could also partner with a local agricultural testing lab. Uh, meeting with the identified producer to kind of determine what cover crops will look like on their farm, identifying certain things like acreage goals, uh, over the next few years, what is this going to look like? Are we going to be able to do a cost share method where the company will cover a portion of the cost of implementing cover crops. Cover crops can be quite expensive, including labor and everything else that goes with it. It can be up to $40 an acre, which is pretty cost prohibitive for most farmers. Um, and then hopefully beginning project implementation in 2020. So that will look like cover crops in the late fall, depending on the method that they use. There are opportunities to plant cover crops interseeded, which just means that you get to take a really cool machine and plant cover crops into your already growing corn or soybean product. Uh, and then we do actually hope to do field days later on. This probably won't happen in 2020, maybe something like 2021, 2022. Not only to promote the partnership between the Nature Conservancy, <clears throat> the distiller that we're working with and this producer, but also hopefully scale out adoption to other farms in the area. We also want to invite, um, um, potentially invite other distillers to these field days to kind of encourage similar practices across distillers in the state of Kentucky. <coughs> Long term, we are looking at creating a report that can be published not only in scientific magazines, but popular magazines, something like Food and Wine or Nature, to reach the general public. Again, this is where we're going to get that marketing claim for the company, where they can really kind of promote the good work that they've been able to do. And then scaling to other distillers. We have had pretty good meetings with the Kentucky Distillers Association to talk to them about sustainable agricultural inputs, which right now is not something that they're really looking at, but we're hoping that once we kind of have like a case study to show like this is how this worked, this is how we engage with the company, and we do recognize that if the Kentucky Distillers Association were to promote something like this, this would not be a one-size-fit-all. Uh, other companies may identify they don't want to do cover crops. Maybe they want to do pollinator habitats or uh, buffers to reduce water impacts and things like that. So there is a lot of wiggle room within this. Um, one of our partners really said it the best, good soil is good bourbon. Mm -hmm. So does anybody have any questions? And this is my contact information, just in case anybody has any burning questions they want to send me emails about. And my adorable dog. <laughs> Might be. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I do live in Kentucky, so I will give the caveat that these are mixes that are 
probably going to work best that side of the Mississippi because Colorado is high, way higher elevation, different soil types, those kinds of things. Uh, really popular cover crop mixes where we are are things like winter wheat because they die over the winter so you don't always have to have the cost of burning down, which is like spraying with glyphosate, and killing it. Uh, cereal rye is another one. Uh, there's also a lot of like mixes. Some people will do turnips, radishes, and then clover to kind of increase that water infiltration. Uh, NRCS, which is part of the USDA, USDA has cover crop recommendations for every region. So if you're looking for something more specific to the Western region, their website would definitely be a good resource. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yep, a uh, question from Mike in TNC. He wants to say to you, so based on Kim's observations and experiences, why does she think people in Kentucky are so fond of drinking in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> well, Kentucky is, or Kentucky is the founder of bourbon. Elijah Craig did find it in, I think, like the 1700s. It is also the only, like, national liquor. Uh, there is a, uh, like a Congressional Bourbon Act. So we are very serious about our bourbon. There are more bourbon barrels than people in the state of Kentucky. <laughs> so there's a very big heritage tie to it. Uh, even during Prohibition, you could actually like get a prescription from your doctor. To <laughs> um, have, for our farmers that have already agreed to participate, have you collected baseline data on the soil? And also, what does the monitoring program, or how do you foresee the monitoring program uh, looking like in the future of this project? So we have yet to meet with our identified producer. But that is actually one of the biggest barriers we have in the state of Kentucky. We don't have very good baseline data. So once we do engage with the producer, we will take a baseline soil test. Uh, it's possible that through that soil test, we may also take a plant test uh, on their standing corn to see like what their retention rates are for certain minerals and things like that in the corn to see if we can approve that over time. We have another soil health research project that we're engaging with outside of this urban supply chain management that's also looking to do the same thing in other farms in the state of Kentucky because we don't have that soil baseline data. Uh, and because we don't have the baseline data, it's hard to, to show like, oh, this is how much we've improved mm -hmm. because we don't really have anywhere to go. So thank you. That's an excellent question. Great project, by the way. This is, Thank you. This is awesome. Um, I'm curious if there's any type of certification that will be put into place for these farmers or these distillers to advertise that they're using the suggested growing practices. So we've talked about that a lot. Um, we, when we first started to engage with the distiller, we talked about different certification processes because there are like over 300 third, third party verification things out there that people can go through to show like, look, we do sustainable sourcing or we engage in this, this, and this. There's B Corporation, which a lot of people are kind of familiar with, which doesn't really have anything to do with agriculture. Right now, the answer is no. Uh, the Nature Conservancy in Illinois and Indiana have a program that they've helped develop, which is called Star Farms. Uh, we've looked at potentially expanding that into Kentucky as a whole, not just with this bourbon project. So it is possible moving forward that might become of it, become a part of it. But right now, no, there's no like nice thing you can put on a label that's easily recognizable. I have a question. Um, do you, is there any word of mouth data or whatever you could call it of soil degradation and taste degradation with bourbon over time? No, and I'm actually, so. Like it ain't made like it used to be. <laughs> yeah, exactly, it ain't made like it used to be. <laughs> the answer is no, and some of that has to do with actually how the distilling process works. So, um, there's like small batch bourbon, there's single barrel bourbon, and then there's bourbon. So a lot of like bourbon that you would normally buy is um, they'll take the barrels off the rick house and kind of dump it into one bottling facility and mix it all together. So that kind of stabilizes the flavor. But with this agricultural project, we do have the ability to potentially work with the distiller that we're working with to create a small batch that they then could see if there is a flavor profile difference because with cover crops, you are increasing your soil organic matter as well as some of the other nutrients available in the soil, which could potentially change the flavor profile. So it would be interesting to see that. All right. Thank you, guys.
Okay, hello everyone. I'm Ben Loki, and my project is a sustainable business model in the Gunnison Valley. And first of all, like I said, I really like working this panel because the perfect blend of supply chain management uh, goes together well, but it definitely makes me thirsty. Following <laughs> 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 beer and bourbon and then getting on the business also makes me feel like the downer. <laughs> it's all party and then, oh, he's going to talk about business. So <clears throat> my focus over the past year has been on reconnecting our natural environment to our built environment and um, kind of looked at an applied project throughout this entire year. So I'm going to use business and project interchangeably throughout this entire presentation. So just keep that in mind. This is my grad school project, but also I've been flying under the radar for the past six months running an LLC um, that was part of my grad school project. So in that, uh, this, this project really looked at trying to connect forest ecology and natural building, and doing that through um, local supply chains, local supply chains of salvaged timber, um, and really salvaged logging, because there's a difference there. And I don't know how many of you really know about salvaged logging, um, so I'm going to define that real quick so we can move on. We're all kind of on the same page. Salvage logging looks at taking logs off of forest management projects that could be from uh, fuel mitigation, beetle or, or insect infestation, um, dwarf mistletoe, uh, any type of disease, any type of fire outbreak or flood. So it's basically the trees in the forest that are no longer deemed um, part of that natural environment's resiliency and are also deemed not part of uh, uh, an economic benefit. So we kind of rescue those trees and recirculate them back into the local economy. So what drove this project? This project was drove um, out of my personal three passions. And those passions are uh, the preservation of our natural landscapes, specifically around Gunnison County. Uh, I've been out here for 18 years and, and, and love, as many as you do, our natural landscapes and our natural wilderness and want to see the preservation of it passed on for future generations. Uh, my other passion, as many of you know, um, is natural building. And I've kind of given an earful over the past year of what I keep referring to as biophilic place-based building. It's that idea of building out of innate love for your natural environment, and doing it in a way that uh, creates harmony with that environment using natural materials and natural design concepts, techniques, and methods. And the other part of it is, is my passion for applied learning. Some of that comes from being a father. I love the idea of generational knowledge transfer, transferring knowledge from one generation to the next. But specifically here, I'm talking about applied learning within forest ecology and natural building and, bling, and bringing that model together where we can offer uh, forest ecology education and natural building education in kind of this circular economic model. So then I look at the problems, and this really, this one's going to, I'm going to stick on the slide for a little bit because there is, again, not to be the business downer here, but there's quite a bit of problems that, that were addressed that MBI really looked at through um, the past year that evolved this project. Um, the first one is declining forest health. GMUG, uh, Gun uh, Grand Mesa, Uncompadre, and Gunnison National Forest is what surrounds Gunnison Valley. And it's about 498,000 acres. In 2018, Colorado suffered 478,000 of fire de devastation. So that absolutely degraded our forest health. That puts water um, tables and, and, and watersheds at high risk. It puts a uh, declining health of air quality. Um, it decreases wilderness and wildlife habitat. Um, and it degrades soil health. And, and so we have this huge depiction of, we have about 8 million standing dead trees, 6 million acres in our surrounding forest that are kind of primed as a Kindle box. So Colorado State Forest Service and National Forest Service are really gearing up to incentivize, you know, these efforts to go in and decrease the amount of, of fuel potential we have in our forest because they see that if this ignites, 
and, and has a potential to because our last major fire that we saw was about 1947. So we haven't seen a major fire throughout um, Gunnison County in a long time. So our, our forest is primed for a major fire. And so they've been working hard at fuel mitigation, defensible space, taking these timbers out as far, to, as, far as a forest treatment of prescription, prescription projects. Um, so there's a, there's a huge opportunity there. But that's a problem that really drove uh, this entire project and is really driving uh, the business model of MBI to recover um, salvage logs. So the other problem that really has drove the project has been really evident and is, a, and is another uh, passion I've had is addressing inefficient salvage logging supply chains. As we look at oh, at the, the peak of the logging trucks that come through Highway 50 and, and move west, um, the peak of that is about 100 logging trucks a day, right? And they go to the largest um, mill in Colorado, and from there, 90% of that goes is exported outside the state of Colorado, by 10% of it comes back into Colorado for local Colorado economies, and only uh, just over 0% comes back to Gunnison Valley. So that's a broken supply chain. Uh, the other part of that is being a, a builder uh, in this valley for about 17 years, and talking to the local lumber yards and getting a feel for where this material that we're all using, all the local builders are using, comes from, about 90% of that, 90 to 100% of that building material comes outside of the state of Colorado, so it's imported. So that just shows a huge opportunity of what can be addressed to decrease transportation emissions from the logging trucks, provide jobs, and try to build in harmony with our local natural environments by addressing inefficiencies in salvage logging supply chains. Um, the other one is the diminishing knowledge transfer through applied learning. This is one that's a needs gap that I wrestle with throughout my entire time in MEM is I have desired natural building of applied knowledge in my own life. And so I've chased that down for the better part of several years and I've had some great mentors like Dusty Zamanti who have, who have uh, fortunately given me some of that base knowledge. And, and the rest of it, I really kind of run through the valley and I see the guys like Killian that are here, they're representative of that, that natural design build um, industry that's just barely taken hold and moving in Gunnison Valley. And I've been to other places and been really encouraged by how resilient an economy can be when they tap into natural building and they build in harmony with their, their local natural environment using local natural resources. So long story short, there's not enough of it. <laughs> uh, so the opportunities, and that goes right back to my passion. So luckily for me, um, the opportunities coincide with my passions. Um, the opportunities are to promote forest health. Natural Building Innovations aims to promote forest health by working in collaborative, uh, in a collaborative approach with local, state, and national forest or forest organizations. Um, I see Scott Sorensen still in the room if you walk out. Oh yeah. So one of my partners here is, is Scott uh, Sorensen from, um, uh, oh God. Mountain Treescapes. <laughs> Thank you. I just had the worst brain fart in my life. <laughs> uh, a Mountain Treescapes. So we've been working together and we've, we've actually had three retrievals with um, Mountain Treescapes and Scott Sorensen. And the idea is to work in harmony with those guys as they go out, they do fire, uh, fuel uh, mitigation, defensible space, they look at taking these trees and they fell them, they debark, they delimb them, they debark them, and then they deck them. And a lot of times there's a bit of a, a cost inefficiency of what they're going to do with those uh, deck timbers. And so that's where MBI wants to go in, responsibly recover them, and promote forest health by decreased emissions, having a light ecological impact as we aim to mill on site and then um, efficiently bring those materials right back into our local economy. So that goes into our closed loop supply chain. Um, additionally, this, this type of model I feel like can create local jobs. Um, we look at kind of short term and long term scalability of MBI. Obviously short term it's, it's myself and fortunately some amazing interns, um, but I really hope to kind of create a more robust business where we can hire people and we can really start making a difference in, in uh, creating local jobs and creating um, community resiliency through uh, using local natural resources. And then obviously applied learning. There's a huge opportunity for this valley to grow with applied learning in forest ecology and natural building that can be beneficial for the long-term resiliency of Gunnison Valley. So and that takes a lot of collaboration. 
um, refocus on, natural good innovation focus on a triple bottom line between education, economy, and the environment. And those are our three main factors that we made sure, as I took the last eight to 10 months, we hashed out over and over again, how can we create a business model that does not leave one of these factors out? And not only does it not leave one out, it doesn't, it doesn't um, undervalue any of them. It creates an equal balance between those three. And we came up with what are the most appropriate partners for, for this that are gonna be supportive of us, that are gonna help us with this model. And these are the ones we came up with. So we spent a, a really good amount of time trying to develop some of these partnerships and connections. And we've made some significant progress. So I would say, and I wanna get into some of the achievements um, over the past year of this project. The one I'm most proud of by far is the mentorship program that Natural Building Innovation has. Um, over the past year, we've had uh, three different interns um, that have come on board. And the, the model that we have developed is a volunteer to an internship to an apprenticeship. And so when we look at that internship, it can be both for credit or non for credit. And we've had um, three different interns right now, Jack, uh, Thomas over there, he's our first one that's going to be an apprentice this summer. He's already gone through both the for credit and the non for credit internship with MBI. And now he's, he's moved up to an apprentice and he's done amazing things with cost structuring and the, the financial projections with MBI. And it's given him an applied skill to actually be learning these things as he's doing them for a new sustainable startup in Gunnison County. And then Jake um, Raver here, he's been working hard not only with website stuff, actually he's a, he's a man of all trades for sure. But he's gone through the four credit, and now he's going to be helping out this summer, and he's been a huge asset, as well as Ben Thornycroft, who this summer is going to be a four credit intern looking at the applied learning side. Um, he's going to be working in the field. Um, uh, we're trying to get him on the sawmill. That's, I think that's his passion. He really wants to work in the trees, be with the trees, so we're going to try to get him those skills. And, and again, this model has been by far the most meaningful to me as I look at applied learning and generational knowledge transfer. So some other accomplishments are uh, the workshops in education that, that we started facilitating and putting on and even learning from. This one here is up in Lagaritas, and that's with, it's on a forest management project for timber harvesting. Um, the next one is a, a, a traditional timber frame workshop that I went to in uh, the Yestamar School of Design Build in Vermont, made the school with a, with a phenomenal curriculum. Um, and then the other one is a, a workshop I put on for middle school students that we did look at um, those local salvage log supply chains of taking that timber out, processing it, making some, something out of it, and the importance of using local natural uh, building materials in our projects. And this one was just the most fun. I uh, spent some time with Hership Biotexture, and I hope I have some people chiming in from Hership because um, they're part of my family now. And went through the Academy in Taos, and then this here is um, the build of an Eco Lodge that we did in Colonia de Sacramento in Uruguay, a month long project. And I see Rachel over there smiling. She's also a Hership family. And then Danny, not only, uh, someone take a minute, Danny Elster is not only Hership family that, that just got into town yesterday to, to support, but she's going to be here for the next three or four weeks before she goes on to um, her field training in Taos with her ship. And she's also going to be NBI's first global intern. So if you see her around, raise your hand, Danny. If you see her around Gunnison, give her a good warm Gunnison welcome, please. Woo. Um, okay, so looking at further accomplishments, now, low ecological impact was uh, one of the things we're really aiming to do as, and this is a great picture because this was our first retrieval and all of us have really chuckled at one, how muddy and rainy was, but two, how we really hope to get the funding we need to get a little more advanced in this primitive style of, of retrieving logs. But um, low ecological impact as we mill on site, as we assess um, um, the minimal impact we can do in the forest as we're retrieving. Uh, then we also look at repurposing logs and then our kind of circular economy, circular economy model that responsibly recovers, processes, recirculates, and then offers forest ecology and natural building throughout that process. Um, so other ones in the economic area, uh, diverse accomplishments, and I'll skip through a lot of these, but the one I'll point out is 
Uh, Jan Swift from Swift Out Design just recently launched naturalbuildinginnovations.com. It's our website. So if you get a chance, check that out. We're just getting rolling with that, and that's part of our business structure. And then uh, we're having some help and assistance from CBPHE, which has been an amazing benefit to us for uh, the resources they provide and uh, the funding they've also provided for us. So where are we now? Um, we have Evelyn's Park project coming up uh, about the first two weeks of June where we're aiming to responsibly cover as far uh, from a forest treatment project just south of Crestview by about a mile where they have beetle hill, uh, beetle infestation and dwarf mistletoe. And then we have uh, some proposed land, um, some employees and interns, and again, the generous $5,000 next cycle um, grant as well as scholarship they've offered. And a special thanks to all these people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Questions? Can I, can I just ask, you know, you, you dropped a lot of names here, people from the building community. Um, can I ask those folks to stand up? Anybody who's been a colleague of Ben's in the, in the building community. I see Dusty here. Can you just stand up for a second? I want to get a sense of who Ben's weaving together here. <laughs> yeah, welcome. Well. Can, can you talk about that process, Ben? Because it's a small valley, uh, highly competitive industry that you know, sort of can be boom bust. Mm -hmm. um, where are you seeing collaboration come from instead of just competition? Uh, one is, I think it's vital. I think, especially with a guy like me coming in with, with kind of a big idea like this, and, and especially my approach, some of that know me is a little bit of a head down approach, um, I leave with the forehead. But these guys, and not just the local natural builders and uh, Eric Jansen kind of representing um, uh, basically policy and, and building inspector uh, here in Gunnison, but also bringing better bringing together Colorado State Forest Service, National Forest Service, and having this approach to tackling uh, not only supply chains, but then also that education. And we have a lot of pushback. And I'll say, I'll say this, over the past year, one of the biggest challenges has been um, the skepticism to a, a model like this. And um, a lot of conversations, see guys, thanks for coming. And a lot of that skepticism, I think, comes from uh, the lack of collaboration. We have a lot of people kind of off on their own elements, doing their own thing, that really want to see this happen. Most people want local supply chains. Lo most people want to build in harmony with the local natural environment. Most people want local natural materials. Most people want um, the good feel of a home that they can walk through like this. This connects me to the natural environment. Most people want solutions for, uh, within the building sector. Um, but bringing this team together, bringing these people together and identifying them has been uh, not only a very challenging process, but a very rewarding one and beneficial one. So yeah, this is, this is definitely not a, a Ben Loken MBI thing. This, is, this won't happen unless that collaboration really takes root. Question from Genevieve. How are you developing sales now and to whom? What happens with the byproducts from the on-site melody? So this is where partners like Mountain Treescape, Scott Sorensen, come into play. Um, he chips and he has different uh, uh, people who, who buy those wood chips from him. So we look at whether it's uh, when we mill that product, we have sawdust that can go to chicken coops, that can go to animal bedding, um, that can go to composting. We look at some of the delimbing and, and wood chipping from that, that eventually as we look up and we uh, kind of scale up oops, to possibilities, this is beyond, but um, kind of composting, and this is something uh, Butch Clark and I have had a few conversations about, look at a biochar, you know, what are some of the uses, and that's, that's the aim of NBI. We have no desire, and part of our plan is absolutely to use every byproduct that comes out of those forest treatment projects. Any others? How exactly have you been marketing your brand? Um, a lot of word of mouth so far. So do you have a target audience in the community? Yeah, the target audience is definitely going to be um, 
It's going to be our contractors and our builders. So we look at guys like Slate Home Design, guys like Dusty Zemansi, guys like B, uh, uh, Big C Builders, guys like uh, Killian and his project with uh, Habitat for Humanity. We want to offer custom rough sawn products, uh, structural timbers, finished products, um, post and beam, we want to offer it to contractors, the business owners, the residents, the community members, and we want to do that not just as a product we offer. The, the really cool thing, let me say this, the really cool thing is that every product we offer and every product we use in a project that MBI puts on, we want to guarantee that it comes from locally responsibly harvested best practices of a forest management project. And we want to do that for our clients. We want to do that for the contractors. We want them to go to their clients and be able to say, hey, do you want this model? Do you want to have these locally responsible harvesting materials on this project? And we're, we're gambling that people do. And that's something that time will tell. Are there One more. A comment from the distance and question. The comment is, thank you to the School of Environment and Sustainability for streaming these presentations. The question is, Ben, how do you teach your city sister and family to buy it, buy into all nature? How do I teach what? Your city sister and family to buy into <laughs> all nature. Oh, I Here's think what? all natural. Oh, <laughs> okay. that's my sister. In wonder. <laughs> I I would hope by now, um, just living that example. That, that's all I can do. That's all we can all do. And and I give one really quick reference from um, Irakambi, a lady that said, "There's a huge fire in the forest, and one bird takes a drop out of out of a lake and is flying back and forth and spitting that drop into that forest as the other birds are mocking." And they say, why? Don't you know that's completely pointless? And, and that bird kind of responds, but it's all I know how to do, and it's my part, so I'm going to do it. Thank you all very much. Panel, it's time for cross-cutting questions. Which bee comes first? Uh, just about oh, here. Time. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the way we live. I, uh, so with um, hey, hold, hold the plug. Uh, let's let's yes, have a little Q&A here. Uh, Amanda, 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 you may not hear me, but I'm talking. I got you. Yeah. I can't hear you. Um, <laughs> Start over. So the um, I'm just wondering, like in this work, have there been any projections, or I didn't hear that conversation about the increase in yield that yes. the, the cover crops and the intercropping will provide, and just what an economic benefit that provides the farmer as well. So that is something that uh, we are really interested in as the Nature Conservancy is. Uh, conducting that soil health research to show that economic benefit to the farmer. Now, Illinois, Indiana, and Iowa, the I states, the big ag states, and Nebraska have all kind of started to produce these uh, research studies that focus on cover crops and other sustainable agriculture practices that show the economic benefit to the farmer. We don't have that yet. So we are hoping that both with this distillery project and the other soil health research project that we're doing, that we can develop that for farmers because one of the other reasons why it's so cost prohibitive now is there's no demand. Uh, we have, and this is, this is going to sound crazy low, but I'm going to tell you right now, this is about the national average. We have about 3% adoption of cover crops in Kentucky. And that number is also terribly skewed because we have very little data. Uh, some people will tell you it's more, some people will tell you it's less. There's no data collection. So we're really working hard to drive that data collection so we at least we know, you know. So thank you. Yeah. Ben, amazing work. That is just so exciting. Do you see um, more connection to MEM? Having MEM students, do you see projects in the future? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. My my dream, I think my dream stems from a lot of people's dream. I'd love to see an entire master's program or undergrad program that really implements and offers applied learning in natural building forest ecology. And I've, and I've been impressed. I've seen progress in that. There's been some, some great efforts uh, just with recent connections. 
and uh, I see, you know, Coop doing some amazing things with forest ecology. So there's advancement in that. I see great opportunity, and, and I don't see good opportunity. I think I think it's absolutely necessary, and I think there's a huge appetite for it. I think um, young generations coming into uh, academic institutions are craving applied learning and skill sets that really offer them the ability to go on from there with something that's tangible, that, that creates self-reliance, that, that empowers them to go on with their lives. Awesome. Does the National Forest help y'all? Are they interested in you harvesting their trees or not? Absolutely. So I'm, I'm a little guy, right. um, for sure. And I've had several, com this has been the, the probably the funnest part of my project is sitting up with guys like Sam Pankratz, uh, Mike Tarantino, Art Haynes, the guys who, who they know what they're talking about. They know what they're doing. They've put their ear to the forest for, for decades, especially Art Haynes, and conversations with them. And I would think, honestly, that's what's kept me going. Um, when I have pushback from other sectors, and I sit with those guys, and not only are they supportive, but they're in, in, encouraged, and obviously they have to be impartial. They can't show favoritism to any force or organization, but at the same time, the support they've given for this direction and how they say it's absolutely necessary. They're overworked, they're overstressed, the challenges they have are too big. Small, sustainable startups that address fuel mitigation, treatments and prescriptions, going in and helping on thinning projects in any way, they're all about it. Yeah. Go ahead, me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a question for Ben. Um, do you think there's any willingness from the county or the city or even the town of Crested Butte to use some of this timber for uh, either remodels or new public buildings? I mean, I'm just thinking the Center for the Arts was just built and I feel like there should be some engagement there with something Absolutely. that is doing good overall for us in the long term. Yeah, and, and Eric Jansen just snuck out, otherwise I would totally put him on the spot. Oh. So he's a building <laughs> inspector here uh, that just he had to leave. But um, <coughs> our boys play soccer together. This is the great thing about living in this valley. We sit and, and you know, bullshit about like this type of model and, and the future of it and how the need is for it. And I, I kind of look at him and I say, what kind of pushback am I going to get? And he's very transparent. He says, no, I think the time is now. I think it's time to go. We're, we're looking at guys like Killian that have a um, Habitat for Humanity project where he's uh, approached MBI and said, hey, are you at a point where you're ready to start providing materials for this project? And my response is, is the community ready for me to do that? Can I start um, processing these materials and even the structural materials and offer them back on these projects without getting just a ton of red tape and pushback? And Eric Jansen reassured me, absolutely. Go for it. Awesome. I just have a, a comment or an addition to that. Uh, Eric has been amazingly supportive in that regard. And uh, we just Monday approved all, nearly all of the lumber for the Habitat project um, with the local engineer, Jerry Green. So it's totally possible. Yeah. Now it's just a matter of somebody dropping a couple bags of money off for MBI. <laughs> <laughs> so I see you guys have like really thought through and been thought leaders for three separate industries. Have you thought about taking what you learned and what you've gained and sharing with the industry, like at conferences or speaking engagements? Oh, 100%. Like beer, bourbon, uh, trade associations, stuff like that? Oh, yeah. So we actually, so in Kentucky, we have uh, the Sustainable Spirits meeting uh, in October-ish, which is led by the Kentucky Distillers Association, the Division of Compliance, and a couple other organizations. So this year, we could potentially present at that meeting what we're doing, but we're hoping more so that we might do it next year because we're going to have actual data uh, and like lessons learned and shared knowledge available at that point. So we've already kind of like built that into our model that yes, we want to we want to promote this because we want to take a non-regulatory approach to sustainability. We want companies and producers to have the opportunity to participate voluntarily instead of being like, well, let's go the other way and work with the division of ag to make some sort of weird regulation um, because that just doesn't seem to work. <laughs> yeah, I actually, uh, well, my community sponsor helped me send my project to um, a big convention this summer in New Orleans. It's the American Society of Brewing Chemists. So I will be presenting this again there awesome. on a poster. So, yes. Yeah, so we just, and I mentioned um, CDPHE um, and the Next Cycle program. We just got done here a couple weeks ago, pitching in Denver. They invited us out um, as part of 
uh, incubator program to really help us pitch and market better and really for them I think to assess where we're at. So we want to engage them. We want to, we absolutely have to have their support and uh, it's going to be vital for, for us to continue. I think uh, Bay Area Brewers is looking for even more integration. They ask, how about a combo of bourbon distillery, brewery, and an all-natural building? <laughs> So in our environmental policy class, one of our most contentious weeks is often our discussion about free market environmentalism. So 18 months from that conversation, having been steeped in these sort of market-based projects, what's your take? Do you have thoughts on, on arguing for or against business interventions in the environmental movement? I, I, I through all of the research I've done, which is sensitive at this point, I'm 100% for it. I know there are negatives that come with it, like greenwashing. Uh, the example that I gave in my presentation about Cheerios, to tell you the negative side effects of that, the wildflower seed mix uh, included invasive species. Uh, so that was not good. Uh, received some some blowback for that. Uh, but overall, I really think that encouraging companies to work with producers to, buy, to provide incentives to engage in sustainable agriculture is, is the way to go. Uh, to give a positive example, Wrangler has partnered with the Soil Health Institute, uh, TMZ has been involved, the World Cotton Organization to develop sustainable agricultural practices for cotton producers in the American mm -hmm. South. Uh, they've worked with, they started in Alabama, they've scaled out to Georgia, Tennessee, I think North Carolina to work with producers and they're just now coming out with their first sustainable brand of jeans. And to me, like that's, that's impressive. Like that's, and they're, they're cost effective. It's, it's really the, to me, the smarter way to go. So in beer, it's like a yes and no, I guess. <laughs> Cause I think about like the big guys pushing this and then you think of the Bud Light and Coors battle and all of that fun stuff and what marketing can do on that end. But I mean, the, the small breweries, I feel like don't necessarily have to say it as often because it's, it's just more of a transparent conversation already. Um, but it definitely gets interesting when you look at the different scales within that. And I'm not, Completely sure I'm staying on track with this answer, but I, I will say that when I look at Montrose Forest Products, uh, largest mill in the state of Colorado, and I look at ABI, barely crawling, I look at amazing opportunity. Uh, I've actually had a few conversations lately in trying to better understand how to make that connection, that relationship, and even conversations of what about some uh, some type of programs that really incentivize small sustainable startups where they can benefit. They can benefit by saying, yeah, 90% of our, our timbers go out of the state of Colorado, but we have a few acres set aside here that go to small local startup businesses. And so that's how I see um, kind of the, the, the big corporations, the small corporations kind of getting through this. I don't know. It's either or. Why can't it just kind of be an end? We have time. Is anyone else online, Jess? There's a lot of people online, but no other questions right now. I got more questions from the room, perhaps. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, but how come cash crops are not considered as a you know uh, you know rotating crop like soybeans or yeah because they use too much nutrients in the soil or uh, so conservation rotation is is what that method is called. So uh, in most states, uh, I shouldn't say that in Kentucky. <laughs> I'll talk about what I know. So in Kentucky. Uh, crop rotation is actually very popular for that reason. Uh, so a lot of farmers will do corn soybean rotation to conserve soil health. Uh, soybeans are nitrogen fixing, so they do provide that nitrogen back. The problem is, is that when there is no crop on the field, so after harvest, that's when we're seeing a lot of soil loss, especially for us in Kentucky, it's very wet. We have a lot of uh, erosion issues, uh, gully erosion is what it's called, which I will fully admit that I did not know that was a call of gully, I call it a ditch, but uh, <laughs> when you're driving down the road and you see a big old ditch in a field, that's called gully erosion, it's from water erosion. Um, cover crop or crop rotations do help that, but 
in Kentucky, we have really high adaptation of that, but other states like, uh, I'm gonna call it the I states, they don't always have that. They do corn after corn after corn because it's more profitable for them. The soybean market, especially in the last year, has been very volatile. Uh, so there's issues there too with crop rotations. Um, just to toot Kentucky's horn though, we are a big adopter of no-till. We actually are the leading no-till state. Other states will tell you no-till means no corn, which means you're not gonna get a crop, which is not true, we prove it. Well, I think that we should congratulate three new masters. Woo!